Hello. All right. Sorry about that. Last minute technical difficulties. Mark Wiggins, Fortinet Federal uh, Business Development for DOD. Um, Want to talk to you this morning about uh, a soup to nuts approach uh, that won't put you to sleep, I hope, but also more important to cyber defense and how through integration, automation, leveraging various uh, platforms to put it all together. So for the government end user, we're lowering attack surface as well as making automated responses available within a policy and doctrine that makes sense from a DOD perspective. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, we'll talk about uh, points of inflection today uh, from a digital transformation as well as a security transformation, um, which obviously takes into account uh, heavy virtualization, cloud, Internet of Things you may or may not have heard of before. Uh, more importantly, the changing threat landscape. Um, as part of the security transformation, uh, you know, we won't get into the boring details of basic security principles, the security fabric, and the discussion of fabric integration. My apologies on that uh, omission there. Uh, today's infrastructure, where are we, and the challenges that we face. And as the wise philosopher, American philosopher, Matthew McConaughey in the Lincoln commercials, before you go forward, sometimes you got to go back. Um, so with that, um, yesterday's network, especially from a government perspective, some of the challenges that we're dealing with in, in transforming uh, the infrastructure today was proprietary, internally built, or siloed by the various contractors who won those various awards. Um, singularly controlled and singularly managed, hence the stovepipe uh, regime. Uh, difficult to scale, and more importantly, a lot of heavy intensive from a personnel perspective. Oh, we got to do a patch. Well, we can do it over here, but downstream we're going to have some issues. So let's shut this down to get to here, and then eventually we'll get it up in about eight to ten months. And obviously, uh, that negates the whole purpose of what you're attempting to do. Um, and the Baseline security philosophy was perimeter-based, moat and castle. Keep it out there, and we'll deal with it uh, as needed uh, and go from there. Today, uh, different challenges that present itself uh, with the bring-your-own-device, uh, the wireless uh, and mobile-friendly environment, um, you know, dealing with those, there are no borders, essentially, uh, so to speak, and then how does the cloud come into play? And we'll touch on that uh, a little bit. Um, you know, dealing with the challenges of the remote workforce. You know, how do we establish those VPN connectivity? Uh, at what size and scale? Do we need to segment that out inside the cloud? Um, the cloud is a beautiful thing. Well, how long do I have to keep feeding it quarters to keep it uh, running? Uh, to the size and scale and veracity that I want to be able to have. Um, also, from a government perspective, not only from an IT perspective, but operational technology, the critical pumps, infrastructure. Uh, as we're going to a sensor-type world, how do we manage that? And obviously, that increases the attack surface, and what pieces of the pie are we going to securely defend heavily and others, eh, it's okay. Um, and that's part of the dichotomy of what we're trying to secure and deal with in a broad, integrated, and automated type scenario that we'll touch on. Private infrastructure, you know, those legacy apps, you know, as this transformation to the cloud comes into play, well, they only use this one or two apps in September. We don't really need those. Well, unless you're the commanding general and certifying the budget for that year and the next year, and the main person who does all the budget relies on those two applications, there could be a problem there. <laughs> and so the refactoring costs of bringing those applications up to speed to then move into 
a new network, a, a new updated cloud environment uh, that can be leveraged today. Very important. And what are those costs and how is that going to be balanced? Software, de software defined data centers. Uh, Agility for critical resources, and this gets into a little bit of micro-segmentation uh, that I'll touch on a, a little bit later with regards to intent-based um, intent um, infrastructure. Um, cloud resources, you know, Office 365, uh, you know, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, enterprise IT as a service, which obviously is near and dear to where the Army's going uh, from a base infrastructure perspective, and then offloading that capability so that the cyber warriors can concentrate on, on what's important. So this is the, the evolving world that we're living in, and it seems that it's getting fa that train is moving out faster and faster. As a result, you're going to have to have security basics, security fabric, and what is that next level of integration and partnerships. And uh, before I forget, we, we transition here. Since there are no boundaries, who do we trust? Unfortunately, we found out you know, insider threat is real. Uh, I trust everybody in this room, uh, having formally worn the uniform, but you know, those are things that people do strange things sometimes. And to have the predictive behavioral analytics as a backdrop to this ecosystem that is being built that can then sort of red flag, hmm, okay. You know, what, why is Johnny in super early or staying super late? And, you know, he normally picks up his kids at 4.30 here or practice there at 5 o'clock. What are the, you know, what is, what is this abnormal file downloads and what have you? And then also various nation state or non-nation state uh, factors involved as well. Um, you know, is this a, a state-sponsored scenario, or is this the kid in their pajamas in the basement at their parents' house who's messing around? Um, so, And lastly, you know, increased coverage, visibility, and response where competent resources are at a premium, whether in uniform, out of uniform, within industry. There's a certain group of experts, and... There's a bidding war, uh, and those are major factors that will help um, that foster innovation, that foster that automotive look moving forward. Uh, digital transformation, um, just want to touch on, you know, from a business perspective, um, many reasons why companies continue to evolve and need to transform. Uh, you know, competition is doing it. So if you're not, if you're not moving forward, you're falling behind, uh, obviously. And in the marketplace where it's a profit-driven uh, world, very quickly things can flip. Um, Forrester uh, predicts that nearly half of their re uh, commercial revenue will be driven by digital by the end, by the year 2020. Well, we're here now. Um, and that's only going to continue to increase over time. Not only will it make them more profitable, but it'll make them more efficient. And more importantly, the customers are driving this. Hey, I can get it on, I can get it on my phone. I can, you know, my user experience is lousy with this bank. I'm just going to switch to this platform. And we're seeing that not only from a banking perspective where those digit, adopted digital practices are in place and in use today, and it's only going to continue to go forward. You know, banking, Venmo, PayPal, you know, used to be a long time ago. Oh, I, okay, here's 20 bucks and we're good. Well, no, let me just and, and take care of that. Entertainment, you know. Uh, my daughter, college student, she's happy as a clam with her Netflix and the earphones and life is good. I don't know how you can look on that little screen, but I guess that's what happens, so... <laughs> You know, those types of things. Streaming services. School year's starting again. Well, the grades are posted. 
that could be good news or bad news, depending if you're little Johnny or little Susie uh, and how engaged your folks are. So as this digital transformation continues over time, there are going to be challenges. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, well, we have to encrypt it. We've got to protect it. And so therefore, that'll keep it safe. Could be a false narrative, false sense of security. Software-defined data centers, well, some of them lacked the advanced L, uh, layer seven security aspects. Bottom line, and drilling it down further, you know, it's about workloads and applications, the ability to move to multiple clouds and consuming those services using mobile platforms, got our phones, uh, in a secure manner that have resulted in significant increase in the encrypted traffic. Well, you know, how do we know? Well, it's encrypted, it's good to go. Maybe yes, maybe no. And the kids in pajamas in the basement and foreign nation states understand that as well, and they're going after it. NSS Labs estimates that the encrypted traffic will reach about 75% of total traffic. That provides hackers yet another avenue uh, to hide behind encrypted flows and find ways into enterprise networks. You know, large catastrophes may follow. Uh, recently, we've seen some of those uh, with some of the hacks uh, through our uh, employee from Amazon and others. Um, in addition, you know, malwares like Zo the Zeus botnet are prime examples of hiding in encrypted flows, stealing banker user information by being as a man in the browser and by logging in keystrokes. This is real. And in addition to the legacy phishing and other types of things that we've had to overcome, um, it's here and it's alive. Uh, cyber attacks are rising, at the same time becoming more sophisticated. And like the cryptojacking malware, install themselves and run in stealth mode to steal precious compute cycles to mine currencies. You know, the ransomware friends holding the various cities hostage. Uh, so it's gone from the, the hospitals to the municipalities, whether it's Baltimore, Atlanta recently. Uh, I saw over the weekend, I think there's about 20 cities that have had issues or, uh, you know, being held up, so to speak, um, over the last uh, couple weeks. So it's scary, and unfortunately, it's real. Um, Earlier, we talked about micro-segmentation um, and that software-defined data center. Um, and, you know, with the cloud, software-defined data centers, and the virtualized world, um, it provides uh, a way to segment networks, control devices, and applications. As a result, you get greater agility and control. Uh, but these resources may be liable to attacks, and once compromised, can be, that can be spread laterally. So the good news, I can scale, I can compute laterally, life is good. If somebody gets inside the chicken coop, that could be really bad news. Um, and then something I'll touch on a little bit later, that's where intent-based segmentation can effectively inspect all types of east-west and north-south uh, traffic and implement consistent security policy uh, to help prevent uh, some of those issues and attacks. <clears throat> security transformation. Um, digital transformation and digital security is driving a corresponding security transformation, which becomes integrated into all parts of the digital technology, resulting in new security architecture that provides a continuous trust assessment. As we mentioned earlier, it's no longer black and white. Uh, it's good or bad. It's gray, and ambiguity is the new reality. Uh, and that's what we're having to contend with. And, let, and then let's throw in some insider threat on top of that, uh, behavioral and predictive an, uh, analytics. And now you can get a true composite picture uh, of what your user behavior is uh, moving forward. Big Brother is getting closer and closer, um, and we'll, we'll touch on that as well. Uh, but this requires a, a different mindset, and uh, government and business alike must continually assess uh, the ecosystem ri risk and adapt as necessary. Um, 
very important way to do that. In dealing with the issues of today, uh, Internet of Things might be in all of the headlines, but it's only one of the issues that the overall net enterprise network is facing. Um, according to a survey conducted uh, earlier this year, it took more than an hour, 61 minutes, today, weeks, months, and years, for over 85% of the companies that were breached to know about it. So it's 15 minutes. You can obviously download quite a lot of stuff. Um, if it's an hour, uh-oh. And then let alone a day or two, Houston, we're going to have a major, major problem here. Um, Additionally, uh, the enterprise network is already trying to deal with, and without addressing IoT first, adding IoT to the mix puts them further and further behind the cyber criminal or the hacker. Uh, and this is part of a um, common core problem set uh, that customers and the government alike face. Um, resources are scarce, as I mentioned earlier, and they're expensive. So we're in that need the expert, you got to bring them in for the bullpen, it's going to cost you. Um, and with the security fabric moving forward, some automation, some doctrinal policy, and the ability to enforce that policy will help, uh, hopefully, not going to alleviate that. Um, IT and security infrastructure. Um, we're getting into a world of diversity as a standard. Uh, what does that mean? That means that there are multiple point products in place, multiple blind spots as a result. And what is the fiduciary responsibility and regulatory responsibility as a result of that? Uh, who owns the data? How do we protect the data? How long should we hold the data for? Who's responsible for holding that data? And when do I give it back to you? All common issues, concerns that a lot of folks in this room have to deal with, and oh, by the way, less data is not coming. It's only going to be more. So then, how do we deal with that uh, exponential growth from a policy standpoint? Um, and then, as part of that fiduciary responsibility, you know, are you able to? How do you avoid fines? How do you enable trust uh, from as a government entity back to your user base? those warriors you're protecting, uh, and also from a business standpoint, you know, from a commercial perspective, oh, well, I can just swipe and go to a different platform and bring all of that business away from who was breached to the latest and greatest scenario. Well, as these grow over time, <clears throat> the landscape continues to change whether it was uh, the virus and malware infections to let's overwhelm uh, with DDoS attacks to, well, email's really big. Let's, let's fish around and, and see what we can come up with to botnets, uh, web surfing here, there, everywhere, that remote access uh, to ransomware and the insider threat. Uh, the Internet of Things, and as we move forward, I'll touch on towards the end, uh, machine learning uh, and a little bit of our artificial intelligence. I'm not an expert in that, so I, I, uh, I have really smart people who can help uh, have that discussion as needed. But that's a, a pool I don't feel like uh, jumping in. <laughs> not yet, anyway. But, you know, how, how do we counter these adversaries, you know, over time? Um, as they move in the advanced ecosystems from a corporate and government perspective. You know, moving forward, as we said, that explosion of data, fusion, et cetera, autonomous vehicles, they're gonna be here soon. Trucking industry, food supply, government perspective, ammunition, parts, supply chain risk management. How does that all fit into the play, and how important is it to have that all secured? And that's just one small example. Um, you know, 10 years from now, your phone will control or get an alert 
uh, yeah, uh, we need more milk, eggs, and uh, butter, and don't come home until, uh, and also you gotta get the baby formula because the kid's going crazy. Um, those will come automatically. Uh, what temperature do you want in your home? Winter, summer, we're gone, I'm coming home from work. What's that gonna look like? Uh, all that's from your phone. And then there is, you know, um, the uh, gentleman from France uh, flew uh, over uh, the English Channel. Well, there's also autonomous vehicles currently being planned and executed in Qatar for police force. So a lot of different things that will be controlled, and that's part of where this fabric environment and initiative will come into play moving forward. Um, you know, how do we defend and secure, um, you know, these things? Uh, and taking a step back, uh-oh, that's bad. Okay. Well, then, bear with me. That's why you always have backup. <laughs> I apologize. Um, point product palooza. Um, the increasing boundary and changing landscape of security consciousness spawned an enormous growth in the need and number of point security solutions. Well, you know, back to that endpoint security. Well, we just need another box. And if, you know, we'll have a lot more boxes and it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You're protected. Okay? We'll get, we'll touch on that. Each system's uniquely focused on a particular area of security concern. Once again, the red boxes take care of this. The white boxes take care of that. The blue boxes take care of the other stuff. And we got the black boxes as a backup. And we'll figure it out as we continue to go through. Uh, integrations focused on vendors' additional offerings, if at all. Back to the stovepipe system and fiefdoms that we've now uh, broken down nicely. Management's required with multiple point solutions. But my management system is not going to talk to that one and yours, and then you're going to have a problem when you're trying to see what the issue is and what the concern is. Uh-oh. So how do we tell the boss that we have a problem, that we're able to isolate it, and, oh, by the way, do that in a timely, effective manner and can go back up to the chain of command and say, took care of it, detonated it, isolated it. They only had access to this little part of our world. Can't do it with this type of setup, the legacy setup. And who's left holding the integration bag? It's not going to be the, uh, it's going to be the end user. It's going to be the customer. How do I deal with all of these stray cats and dogs? Okay, so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to call, we're going to fake it. So, sorry. Um, the challenge continues to grow. Infrastructures currently consist of 20 to 30 uh, security point products. The knowledge of the products and the burden of administration becomes splintered because as your technical experts transfer, imagine that, rotate, or get promoted, their focus changes. Who's coming in behind them to fill that from a personnel perspective? Is he or she as sharp as the guy or the gal who ran it all before? Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe better. Another point of contention to manage from a leadership perspective. Um, specialization requires a larger staff. Keeping pace with updates further complicates issues. And the threat landscape continues to grow and become more coordinated and sophisticated so that if I can head fake you over here, put resources here, I can backdoor you and gain access from this part of the enterprise. Um, not that anybody in this room has ever had this problem, but that, well, we have three wedges and wedge one runs on 13.7, wedge two runs on 14.1, Oh, but Wedge 3 has been upgraded. It's at 14.4. How cool is that? Well, there may be vulnerabilities in the new code, the old code, or the original code, and we don't know that. 
from an end user perspective. And then trying to get them upgraded over time so that you're able to get the most out of those upgrades from a software perspective. Because why? Can't bring down the network because of mission. Can't bring down the network because of cost. Oh, so and so is on leave, and by the way, we only do it on the weekends, and these next two weekends are slated for an exercise. That's reality, that's the world. But these are things that you know, uh, we'll be able to harness and, and move forward uh, on. Let's talk about managing the journey to the cloud. And I had some really cool cloud slides, so I apologize. Um, technical difficulties again here. Um, why the cloud? Leverage automation, endless compute and storage, and it's a great thing. And it's easy to defend, maybe. And the business model that is palatable depends. Depends on what your requirements are and what your end use is. And any uh, adoption model, um, there is uh, the bleeding edge users, the native uh, digital natives moving forward, moving out. Yep, let's put it all in there, make it happen, offload it, and we're good to go. The majority, big toe, they go up to our knee in the water. It's a little chilly. Okay, it's getting better now. You know, how do we secure the journey to the cloud? You know, initially, as we make that transformation from legacy to the cloud, next-gen firewall, uh, cloud access security boundaries. How do we transition those? What will fit our needs? Um, how do we break down that overall encryption-happy type mode uh, that potentially we could come across. Web application filtering, and that the beginning of that security automation from a policy substantiation so that if there is a breach, these are the 12 things I do not want touched, do not pass go, do not collect $200, and this is important. And that has to be defined, and it has to be revised over time. Uh, and then Lastly, those who are kicking and screaming, I like my computer when it works, um, and uh, I, I, I'm good. Well, no, you, you have to give up your server, you have to give up your, and we're going to give you this shiny new tablet that you don't have to be plugged into. Oh, my God, I'm freaking out. How do I do that? So, you know, a little bit of everything uh, within the spectrum. From a cloud perspective, um, SaaS, public infrastructure as a service, uh, and private clouds come into play. Um, okay. So I'll just hit a couple highlights here because you guys are pretty much up to speed on on the cloud and the purpose and what it's trying to accomplish. Um, you know, business units in general uh, want to be able to consume uh, software applications. Um, Office 365, which is currently being deployed, obviously, within DOD. Um, different corporations, Salesforce, customer relation um, modules, uh, the follow-up. You know, why do you keep getting robocalls at 7 to 9 every evening or whatever the case may be, on your cell phone. How did that happen? Um, so being able to consume that, those applications in a timely manner, anytime I want, it's secure and it's there and I'm happy. Another avenue, the developers and the DevOps piece um, of building cloud native applications to support uh, the big five, AWS, um, Azure, IBM, Oracle, and Google. So that these applications with our digital natives come up. <laughs> Sir, ma'am, I have a new way we can, I have a better app or a different way, or I refactored that old legacy application. Here's a way on an x86 based server that could, we can make that happen and move out on. Okay, great, let's test it and go out from there. And there's a lot of talented folks uh, within the services who are doing that. And that's being um, utilized today. 
Uh, lastly, from a cloud perspective, um, there's an IT piece, there's a network architecture engineering piece, and there's a security architecture and engineering wrapped around it. How do we do that? Um, and that includes data center transformation to the cloud and migrating and extending applications to the cloud from the data center and then moving them out. Um, and part of that includes, uh, as I mentioned, the five uh, large pro uh, cloud providers, as well as the ability to privatize that, uh, leveraging Nutanix, uh, VMware, NSX, uh, Cisco, the Azure stack, uh, and other um, capabilities so that you have that playground uh, for development, the ability to then go to a uh, pro light, limited production mode and then full production mode. Um, and part of that cloud security is a shared responsibility. And so uh, we have broken it down in a couple different ways. Uh, and that you have to have, you have to secure the connectivity to the cloud, the application security inside of it, and then how do you have that visibility and control to see if there are calculated events that are causing problems? And the strategy to ingratiate this is through management and automation, broad protection, and native integration. And so, uh, the cloud providers provide the storage, compute, and the networking capability. The customer manages the security and, and the outside security. But the customer determines inside the cloud what security mechanisms are required. So as you scale out in that east-west mode inside the cloud, who, who's in charge of that? Well, I need these resources to make all this happen. Well, what sizing and structure do I need to protect that? You know, and that's where good training comes into play, and the, the, the cloud companies do that. But companies like ours and others are able to help support that from a virtual machine perspective as well. Uh, the key pillars uh, for integration are protection and management, and they're what the customer uses to secure uh, their own cloud. There's a uh, three pillar strategy uh, for uh, you know the broad protection, the native uh, integration, and then the scale out capability for the customer. Um, the three pillars of the security fabric for the cloud and the services capabilities are enabled by each. Uh, Companies are investing in each of these to provide native integration and capabilities across clouds. Uh, the integration to integrate with the major cloud infrastructure, being able to manage it as if it was not a cloud and enabling it to leverage cloud native services. So effectively having a VM version of the different enforcement products can be run on those various cloud platforms. So instead of building boxes for everything, now, from a scale-out capability, we're virtualizing those boxes, but only as an as-needed basis. So less cost, less consumption, and so it goes. Now, it depends. Mission sets, mission requirements, if they're up and running, you know, there's a cost curve there because otherwise it wouldn't be goodness for all, uh, obviously. Um, so those are some things uh, to consider. Um, there's some cloud security stuff, which, oh, we're back, okay. Just didn't like that, okay. My apologies. So from an, uh, we've hit on this, uh, management and automation uh, piece for the uh, east-west uh, capability. Uh, internal to the cloud, security services hubs. So, the solution is to split security from the application development, the centralized, shared, consistent security enforcement, connect networks, data centers, clouds, and provide that inbound and outbound security. And more importantly, you have visibility for all the traffic flows to and through the cloud. 
So who's in there, who's doing what to who, and making sure that that predictive analysis and behavioral uh, attributes are still there. And the benefits uh, are obviously, you know, everything that we essentially we've talked about. Reduce that risk, increase the agility, and enable the mission uh, to get done. Um, I'm going to skip that one and go to containers. Um, so from a container perspective, you know, this is getting, you know, doc, leveraging Docker, Kubernetes, and others um, just to show you that, you know, you have to gain entry via the cloud access security boundary. Uh, once inside, um, a different type of con encryption, uh, in quotes, uh, would be the container uh, side of the house um, so that, Everybody who has access to that, um, you know, you're aware, they're enabled, and it's an integrated registry to enable that. And more importantly, this provides that security for all stages of the container lifecycle. And more importantly, as these applications are being developed, um, there's uh, increased uh, security built in so that down the road, when it's time to go to production, uh, that has been taken care of. One thing with regards to the cloud, and then I'm going to step back a, a little bit. So whether it's public, private, uh, software as a service, um, there's a number of different factors, and there's a lot, some overlap, obviously. So that you need to have partners, and we've, we've done this and others in the industry have done this, leveraging either open standards, which is an option, which may or may not be wise in some government settings, or through a private cloud. Hey, we want to have super security on this. We want to put it behind the government fence and run with it, and we're happy, and it's sort of a closed-loop scenario from a government perspective. Okay, great. We're able to do that. Uh, from a public cloud, hey, a lot of the admin stuff and legacy apps we're just going to move from, put up into a public cloud, have access to, and we're off and running. And, you know, service records, et cetera. I won't say anything about health data yet, but anyway, that's not going public. That would be more private. Uh, and then software as a service. So as these mission-ready applications, you know, for the fusion of data from various RPA data, tagging, et cetera, those elements, to what is the history of us rolling into this town in Afghanistan up on a hill, and, the, and within the last three months, there's been 11 crossfire shootings. Where have those shots come from? And that data could potentially be available and helpful. Or we're going from point A to point B, and the IEDs have notoriously been in these three spots because of cover, terrain, or whatever the case may be. These are the kinds of things that mission sets will be accessing, taking into the end user and give tactical, tactical awareness to the edge, and more importantly, be able to secure that data, and then more importantly, secure the after action report as to, hey, have, they've only gone from one, two, and three. Well, there's like a three and a half, and there's a two and a half because they've changed recently, and we feel the reason is X, Y, and Z. So having the multi-cloud security connectors pre-integrated as part of that within the infrastructure, very important, and that's what we're doing and others. Speaking of automation, all right, the slides work. I'm happy now, um, and appreciate your patience on that. Um, a couple things with regards to the cloud. <clears throat> Usage is metered. That could be good, could be bad. Okay? And as some of the uh, enterprise IT as a service to sort of lower that, make it more of a utility type scenario uh, to get that a little more flat and under control. Um, single plane that pane of glass for access to resources and leveraging automation. 
so that I can spin up multiple things in the same way. Or, you know what? Our requirements have changed. I need to spin up in another direction with greater capability, greater sizing, whatever the case may be. And that can be done, apparently. We've touched on this. Um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, the focus and integration of these pieces, get into the fabric a little bit more, uh, and then open up for any questions or concerns you may have, and then we'll get you guys out of here uh, for lunch. Um, so moving forward, um, we've talked about resiliency and diversity. Uh, they have to be tenants of the infrastructure. We know that. Integration is a necessity to ensure timely detection and response. And more importantly, automation provides the ability for machine-based remediation to known threats. Not anything new here, um, but just want to set the table. Um, from an integration standpoint, um, back to that constrained talent pool, uh, and integration can augment the staff you have today. And obviously with the IT as a service model, cyber warriors focusing on what's important from a mission standpoint makes sense. More importantly, the ability to share that threat intelligence. So now, whether it's from a different vendor than mine, but yet we're integrated, I can then bring that remediation action higher in the queue, bring it to a manager of managers so that it is now in place and now it has been alerted to somebody who has the ability to enforce doctrine, automatically release that, or isolate, do a deeper dive on the forensics of that scenario, meanwhile kicking everything else in the cloud, the enterprise, or the network to a safety setting that, so operations can continue to go. Um, and I'll leave it at that for right now. Um, and more importantly, um, with integration, you don't fall into that trap of, I have a secret, we don't talk to each other, and that's where that clock of 61 minutes to a couple days to a couple months for 85% of the breaches that occur, uh-oh, and, and that's where those delays can come from. This helps alleviate that. Um, I think we've killed automation. Uh, with regards to uh, integration, um, you know, DevOps, very important. We've got to develop these things. We've got to um, see how it fits. Uh, and then we're going to deliver those applications. And these kids today are doing all kinds of really cool, crazy stuff, and they're very helpful. How do we secure them? Oh, well, but it's really cool and it's shiny and it's very super fast. Well, that's where DevSecOps comes into play. That's where that uh, limited resource talent pool comes into play as well. And by leveraging the cloud, by leveraging an overall fabric, you're able to minimize, minimize and mitigate that risk um, to the end users and, more importantly, to the enterprise. Um, a couple things, um, you know, the best practice for how to architect, architect redundant availability zones because essentially you want to have available different things within the cloud as you need to call on them. Um, and as a result, you know, in each cloud network for failover redundancy and maximum uptime when static IPs or, or VPN tunnel failovers are needed. You know, what's the old saying? Two is one, one is none. So living in an uh, active, passive, uh, high availability deployment, uh, the active firewall has an issue. and cannot press, process that traffic. An administrative change is necessary for the traffic to go through the secondary. Well, if I have to manually do that, we could have some serious issues and concerns. That can be easily automated. I'm oversimplifying with a script, but obviously there are other automation tools that can be leveraged to utilize that. 
so that now, if the primary firewall goes down, it makes the appropriate API calls to automate the changes. This unique approach enables the synchronization between firewall states while receiving the security updates from a central manager. So now, where the doctrine is in place, where that's being managed, that can feed and permeate throughout. Up, oh, the network needs to change. We have an issue that's been isolated. Let's kick everybody else to a safety setting, and we're still operational and off and running. And as a result, um, that integration of the threat feeds and the failover is, is a key component. And the ability to do that um, includes um, intent-based segmentation and how is that achieved. So back to our software-defined data center and within our cloud. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, mitigate risk. Ensure that we're compliant not only to um, our stockholders and shareholders, but from a security aspect. Um, ensure that the application is trusted and more importantly, enables overall efficiency. How can this be deployed? Well, it's in support of the branch, uh, office, campus setting, uh, within the data center, and more importantly, within multiple clouds. So as the expeditionary force has a lot more of mobile tactical clouds tied to it, along with the various communication kits involved to support that, um, how can that be secured and then uploaded or updated as required? Oh, and by the way, um, we're not going to have the full spectrum of communications that we think, as we all know, <laughs> and those updates will be intermittent at best with a smaller straw of availability. So these are the challenges that good news, bad news, um, you know, from a tactical perspective um, that'll be dealt with. How do you segment it? How do you segment the workload? Should it be more of a micro place so that, okay, the major workloads for this mission or, or this office setting are over here, and, and that's good news. Port device capability. Bring your own device. That's more of a macro level. Oh, you've checked in uh, down at Fort Bragg. You're now uh, heading off to Fort Campbell. Oh, and by the way, you're now over in Wiesbaden. Okay, being able to do that. Uh, applications endpoints. And then how do we trust the network? How do we trust the identity? And more importantly, the tagging and the orchestration. The orchestration is done by the fabric connectors uh, that we've touched on. And the key benefits, reduce that attack surface, manage the attack vectors and risk, and defense in depth with cost-effective enforcement points. So, and more importantly, we have that trusted application process uh, in place. Lastly, um, on intent-based segmentation, um, Segmented uh, for business intent or for mission intent. The end-to-end -end visibility, obviously, to detect those attacks and encrypted flows and granular web control. Why? What are you going out to that is out of the norm? Oh, wow. Well, I know, you, I know Joe was looking for a new car, but why is he you know, looking at how to immigrate to pick a country, you know? A little bit extreme there, I apologize. Uh, adaptive trust, uh, dynamic access control, once again, are they where they need to be? And then advanced layer seven community, uh, the highest threat protection performance has to be there um, because as we're continuing to push things uh, to the edge. Workflow automation, uh, the ability to have an automated response uh, that can be notified, reported on, quarantine, and adjust the configuration on the fly in accordance with commander's intent, policy, and doctrine for 
something that seems very small and nebulous to, uh uh-oh, we have a full state-sponsored scenario, and we got to get on it and get on it right away. And then there are additional consequences um, that would occur. And then part of the fabric is this automated workflow or stitches within for that communication, whether it's pre-configured, pre-integrated um, uh, responses with, between companies and products, which those do, uh, those are part of the landscape today, um, or overall uh, internal um, connectivity uh, within a management uh, flow down uh, scenario uh, as well. Um, lastly, um, you know, security driven networking so that in the middle you have cyber defenses, you have firewalls, you have endpoint security um, that you're looking at that needs to communicate. You have virtual machi- machines um, for the cloud uh, access security border. Um, you have a- an email, webmail uh, type scenario to a scan. You're able to analyze and sandbox as required. You have the networking side, whether it's access points, switching infrastructure, um, and token uh, access and capability, endpoint security, and then having fabric APIs and fabric connectors to help them all sing and orchestrate together, uh, and then have it centrally managed so that as those stove pipes that we talked about, if, if they still exist today, which they may or may not as things transition, those can go to a manager of managers so that you have full SA as to what's going on in your network. It's a Band-Aid. It's not the right answer, but at least it's in the right direction moving out and heading forward. And what makes the fabric go is third-party alliances. Um, You know, and this is just a small, uh, you know, uh, grouping of uh, the alliance program that has grown to over 50 uh, partners, um, you know, within a two-year period. So this is something that industry is taking very seriously because we understand it will not, it will always be a heterogeneous environment. We have to play nice with others, and more importantly, we have to service uh, our customers and end users. Uh, for that baseline defense that you require and and that's needed. Um, You know, and this goes between large, small companies, uh, you know, for that innovation and to make that, uh, you know, those things sing together. And then, you know, you have to have an eye chart at one point. So anyway... um, this, uh, you know, these alliances and integrations, um, this is to show that it's not defense in depth, but um, it is uh, a fabric type scenario so that everybody has to be vigilant. Um, and we just want to depict here the different avenues that are available as IoT, as the footprint um, continues to expand, as more capability is brought to bear uh, within the industry, obviously within the government, and that greater uh, capability moving forward. Um, You know, and moving forward, um, instead of, you know, a defense in depth uh, attacker with a single strong defensive line, Uh, Defense in depth relies on the tendency of an attack to lose momentum over time as it crosses various defenses and different types of antivirus engines, et cetera, where a modern defense includes deep integration by different types of defenses found in different portions of the infrastructure. So that's what we want to show here in in a big picture. So that, um, to give you a little bit of orientation, you know, primary defense, obviously the cyber side, antivirus, IPS, content filtering in orange, sandboxing, logging, authorization, and those API connectors for automation. 
the adaptive feed um, would be in the yellow uh, in the second uh, concentric circle there, whereby where does machine learning come into play? How do we access that big data for those mission sets um, that I mentioned earlier uh, on the hills of Afghanistan, uh, sniper fire angles, et cetera? Um, and then uh, one thing that we're getting more and more in tune with is the behavioral side, which is only going to continue to grow um, as all this stuff, uh, you know, um, you know, Facebook, you know, here's a, com- uh, I saw this the other day. Um, we have to get a passport or something, and we were thinking about going to France. Okay, great. Well, then all of a sudden, Facebook had a couple ads on French hotels. You know, it's pretty crazy. It wasn't me as a, a friend of mine. It's like, how did that happen? Uh, so anyway, um, you know, it's out there uh, moving forward. Uh, and then um, lastly, all of this is part of the digital attack surface uh, for the security framework and leveraging the fabric. Known and unknown threats, very important, but more importantly with the fabric to be able to have that rapid response and that automated trust assessment in moving forward. So uh, thank you for your time. I apologize for the uh, glitches on the slides earlier. Uh, I'll be more than happy to take some questions uh, on the side uh, if needed, and uh, we'll have a booth to dive further uh, on the floor if need be. Thank you for your time.